Cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people kind of flew in last night feeling a bit jet lagged? Yeah, I, I highly recommend standing on one of these stages. The adrenaline really just gets you over the jet lag quite quickly. <laughs> um, so, hi, I'm John Deeming. I'm the uh, VP for the Platforms of Service Centre of Expertise at Experian. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, some of the thinking we've had to do around container security. So, as we've rolled out uh, containers, uh, Experian takes security very seriously, and there's a few different areas we've had to think about in terms of inspection and controls and things like that. Um, so, I'm going to take you through that. I'm going to start off, explain a little bit about Experian, just if people don't, aren't familiar with Experian. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about our Platform as a Service initiative, what it is that we're setting out to do. Um, and then I'm going to talk through uh, some of the, the sort of security framework pieces that we've got um, and hopefully um, have some time at the end for questions as well. So if you're not familiar with Experian, we are primarily a data and analytics company. Um, so we are really helping consumers and businesses connect better, make better decisions. So from a personal perspective, um, helping you understand your own um, credit portfolio, the, um, make, helping you make better financial decisions, get access to, uh, to better financial products. From a business perspective, helping you um, understand your risk, protect yourself, um, and also generate uh, new, uh, new market opportunities. So we have um, quite a lot of, of different products that operate through over the, the whole sort of customer life cycle, number of different verticals. Um, and as you can imagine, with the sort of data that we're using, security is a, a very important part of, uh, of what we do. Out of interest, just for, again, just a quick show of hands, how many people had uh, sort of heard of Experian before, we, uh, before, before today? Okay, so probably 60%, 40% not. Okay. Um, in terms of the, um, the sort of the side of things from a, a consumer side of things, um, these are the sorts of um, interactions that we, we uh, help with. So obviously mortgage applications, vehicles, insurance and the like. So it, it is a, a really wide range of, uh, of products that we offer and it's also obviously a significant amount of data that we, uh, we look after as well. And um, just in terms of really the, the it's that we have offerings that are m both consumer focused and, and business focused. I think most people when you talk about Experian tend to think of us as um, a credit reference agency, which is part of what we do, but it's certainly not the entirety of what we do. Um, we have a, a, an entire consumer business that's um, absolutely focused on helping individuals and does a lot of work with um, uh, individual credit education and things as well. So. Part of what we're doing uh, over the next few years is we're going through a, a large um, digital transformation program. And one of the pieces of that digital transformation program is our platform as a service. And that's the responsibility of my team, our, uh, our center of expertise. What we're ultimately aiming to do is exactly what it says here. So historically, Experian has been a very acquisitive company. We've had a um, number of different acquisitions over the years across a number of different geographies. And what that's led to is a significant amount of variance with the different application platforms that we have in place, the different programming languages that we have in place, uh, the different architectures. Um, and one of the things that we have identified as a real target opportunity for us is what can we do to simplify that? There's a, a significant value for us in being able to get um, to a, a much more automatable platform to have something much more elastic so that we can be um, cloud agnostic as well. We have some, some uh, areas of the business that are using cloud, um, but they're really coupled to specific clouds. Um, in particular, some of the regions, for example, in the UK, under the, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority, it's mandated that we have the capability to work with multiple clouds. We can't couple ourselves uh, to a specific cloud. Um, and so what we're looking at doing from my team's perspective is putting a reference architecture and the reference implementation together of an elastic platform. So something developers can target for their application development and that we can run elastically. We can use on-prem resources, we can use co-location facilities, and we can also use uh, public cloud, different public clouds as need be. Um, at the core of that, we've, we've picked Red Hat OpenShift as the, the, the Kubernetes platform um, that we utilize. So... The intent is that once we have an application built for the platform, the developer can then roll it out very quickly between development and production because the, the two platforms are functionally identical. 
We can also migrate applications more easily between regions because we standardize the application, or sorry, the platform deployment between regions. So if I have an application that is built and operating in uh, North America, for example, and the business identifies that there is a similar target opportunity, a market we could go after in, say, Asia Pacific, we want to be able to move that application over to, say, Singapore relatively quickly. You know, there, there are th some things that obviously we can't do that aren't magic, so localization, UI changes, um, but there is a lot that can be done um, just in terms of using something like OpenShift to abstract away uh, the underlying platform. But one of the things that that has leads you to is this new containerized architecture, and containers obviously brings with it um, a different workflow, different tools, different capabilities, and obviously as part of that, um, it also brings with it new things you have to think about from a security perspective. Um, and we've, we've spent a fair amount of time as part of this looking at what tools we want to utilize and, and where are the, the attack vectors, what are the things that we think need to be thought about. But as well as building that out, what we've also been trying to do is to embed the tools into the, into the platform itself as far as possible, because what we don't want to do is to particularly couple ourselves again to a specific cloud provider. So it, it, AWS might have a fantastic tool, but if I can't then get that on Azure, for example, that doesn't really do me much good. And you also need it to be available in the data center. So we've also, you know, when we talk about what we've selected, just bear in mind our use case and what it is. I think that the framework we've used will still be useful to everybody in terms of thinking about the different sort of products and, and th capabilities you might need to build in. But just bear in mind, our use case may not be exactly the same as yours. Um, I am going to talk about some specific vendors that we've, we've chosen. I'm not going to go into exact detailed configurations um, because obviously, you know, we're talking about security, so I'm not going to start giving out, you know, passwords and things <laughs> or exact configs. Um, but I, am gonna, I, I will talk about some of the vendors, what we've used, why we've used them um, in the stack. I am, however, going to skip over a whole bunch of basic security stuff. I am assuming that you have all of these sensible security practices in place. So don't assume that I am um, just talking about security as, you know, that, that we talk, what we talk about today is magic and is the be-all and end-all. You still need to have things like a good information security policy, proper architecture governance, all of the things, and more and more and more. It's an ever-growing field. So please don't think that just because I stand up here and I don't, for example, say, oh yeah, let's talk about web application firewalls, means that you don't need a web application firewall. I'm absolutely not saying that. Um, we assume that you know, you've got a, a good chunk of all of these things in place. If you don't, then you, know, you should also look at, um, again, depending on your use case, picking the right capabilities and supplementing what you've got. Also, container security moves really, really, really quickly. Um, as I'm sure probably most people know, the, you know, the, the release cadence of Kubernetes at, at uh, what, for like four releases a year is, is pretty quick. OpenShift is obviously following on behind that. As the new releases come along, there are new, um, new capabilities come on from the various vendors, new pieces of software launch. Um, we also obviously um, see different things happening from an attack perspective. So uh, recently there was the... Um, the Kubernetes vulnerability around the PVC empty, empty mount um, that, uh, that came up, which hopefully everybody's seen the CVE for and patched, and, um, and it's all been addressed. Um, but that was a couple of months ago. You know, that was a, a brand new. So again, the basics of security, um, you've got to keep an eye on the software that you're running, keep an eye on the exploits that are out there. None of this is, you know, the, the, the basics still need to be in place. Okay. So before I go any further, how many people are running OpenShift, OpenShift or Kubernetes at the moment? Okay. And how many people that aren't uh, know what a pod is? Okay, so we've got a mix. Okay. So I'll cover what, what we mean by a pod um, for a second because um, it, it's worth talking about the pod as the core of what we're going to describe. So a pod is a Kubernetes construct, and for anyone that's done a lot of Kubernetes work in the audience, yes, I'm about to simplify some stuff. Please don't beat me up after I leave the stage. A, a pod is basically a, a mechanism of running one or more containers inside of its own, own namespace with an IP address allocated to it, roughly speaking. So you can have one or more container images running. They can be collaborating with each other, providing different pieces of functionality. Um, one might be a monitoring agent, one might be the actual application itself, you might have one that does initialization and setup for you, but fundamentally, from a Kubernetes perspective, the pod is your unit of scheduling. 
So when you set up your application, it will be comprised of one or more pods. Um, hopefully more than one. Hopefully because you're doing something with high availability, you will have a minimum of two pods. Um, obviously there's, um, there's going to be different layers in the application, all that sort of stuff. But as a basic minimum, um, the pod is kind of the, 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 the building block from which everything is constructed in Kubernetes. So when we were starting out, what we started with was we basically took, took a look at the pod and said, okay, so from the life cycle of the pod, what are the various things that we need to think about in terms of uh, the various things we need to be aware of, to monitor, to control, um, to put um, governance around? And that's, um, that's basically what I'm going to talk through uh, over the next sort of 15 minutes or so. So let's start off with images. So container images. The container image is obviously the thing that is fetched from a registry, is loaded into one of the containers when your pod starts up, and is then the golden master that that container or containers is running from. Um, it's going to be pulled in from somewhere. Maybe it's built in-house and it's just living inside your own registry. Maybe it's coming in externally. Um, there's a number of different ways um, it, it could come in. So start off with image provenance. Im image provenance is something that gets a lot of conversation. I'll be honest, I'm more skeptical about image provenance than I think probably a lot of the analysts are. Image provenance gets a lot of talk and it, it, it's great. Image provenance is really about saying, I understand where my images are coming from. I understand how they're composed. Um, I understand the various layers that make them up. The issue with it, for me, is that anyone that is relatively competent as a malicious actor can probably find a way of getting around image provenance. It's not very hard to say, I've taken a, a, an image externally, I'm going to deconstruct it, I'm going to put it back together myself internally so that it, looks, it has a different checksum, and I'm going to load it up into the registry so it looks like it was an internally produced image. It's not a perfect solution. It's absolutely a, a, a core step. It's something you should absolutely look at. Um, but I, d d I would say don't look at image provenance as any kind of panacea. It's a really sensible control, but it is only going to get you so far. Um, so for us with image provenance, we use a combination of Red Hat Cloudforms and Ansible Tower. So Cloudforms is basically looking at our registry and helping us understand where are the image is coming from. So which registries are they using, what sort of, um, what containers are actually using, what, sorry, which projects are using those images, which pods are using those images. So it helps us understand what we have in the environment that's, that's kind of rolled out. Ansible Tower enables us to wrap some more governance um, around some of the, the image uh, importing and artifact workflows. So we can enable developers to, to bring in external images. Um, you may have a set of external registries that you trust that you will let developers pull images in from. Uh, you may have a set of registries that are totally untrusted and you block. Uh, you might say you're going to have a process whereby you will vet every image um, before, it's, before it's imported and you'll only, um, you'll use something like, say, Ansible Tower to put together a workflow. You need to think about that. Um, you need to think about where you're going to get this stuff um, coming into your environment from. Um, that said, even if you decide to block the registry, again, a lot of this stuff is available on GitHub. You know, you can get a Docker file, you can go download the libraries, you can build this stuff yourself. It's not, if someone wanted to go and get some of this stuff and inject it maliciously, it's not beyond the wit of man to go and do this. So you do, so like I say, be careful about relying too much on image provenance. It's a perfectly sensible step, but it will only get you so far. Similarly, um, there's, there's a whole piece around digital signature verification, so understanding and starting to sign um, Docker images. So, for example, I can know that um, this particular image is digitally signed by Red Hat and hasn't been altered since it came to me. Um, that is, that's again useful because I can know that something hasn't been tampered with in the interim. There can be issues with scaling that because if you're going to start trusting digital signatures, you're going to have to have a process to load and manage those digital signatures. You've also got to have a review process to age them out. Um, and again, you've got to be careful whose signatures you're going to accept because implicitly, if you say, I'm going to trust a particular key pair, you are trusting that no one can ever compromise the, the, you know, the, the, the providing authorities um, SDLC process and provide you with an image that has been um, corrupted in some way or had some kind of injection um, placed in it. So again, 
Digital sig um, si signatures, very, very useful for a particular set of use cases, but again, be careful about the way you, um, you how much you rely on this stuff. And I'll talk a bit, the reason I've started with this, I, I, and this probably sounds like a really gloomy picture to start with, but the reason I've started with this is because generally when you start hearing about containers, the pipeline in is the bit that people talk about, and it is important to focus on. But I think that there are things that you, you know, there's other controls that we'll, we'll put around it that hopefully you'll see help supplement this. So the next thing is your Docker registry. Um, absolutely. So the way, you, uh, make sure you're scanning this. So there's, there's a few different products. We go with Black Duck. Um, and that gives us um, metrics around CVEs, code quality, um, what's actually going on in that registry. Um, so we've got an, an understanding um, of the, uh, the, the changes that are happening. We can do reporting. Um, one of the nice things I actually like about using the OpenShift internal registry is because we use uh, an integrated OAuth, I can track any image back to a developer. Because every image is to a project, every project has a requester, so uh, worst case scenario, if we find a particular CVE, I can track it back to somebody from an Active Directory account perspective and say, you've got a problem that needs to be addressed here. You know, there's, you, you can get some, some attribution of, of image, image ownership back. So that's really, really useful. Um, the other um, thing to think about from your image space, and this is, this is more about, I guess this is kind of a, an operational best practice, but think about your, your image layering, and this is probably more for the developers, to be fair, than the platform administrators. But think about the way that you're constructing things like Docker files. Go and learn about best practices. Think about ways that you can minimize the number of changes to the layers so that you're, if you're submitting uh, a new container image, you can reuse as many, image, uh, as many layers as possible. So think about um, not creating too many layers because that, that indirection can cause problems from a performance perspective. But also think about are there a core cool set of layers that you can lay down first and you can then lay your code down above it. Um, there are things like the Red Hat S2I system with OpenShift that, that helps with a lot of that. If you're manually constructing Docker files, then um, you, know, you need to give that some thought. But the reason for saying that is that can also make your system uh, much more efficient. It can also make the security scanning a lot easier. Because if you've scanned the base set of layers and they don't change, you then know, you know it's a lot easier to then just scan the deltas. So it can make that, that, performant, that whole uh, process much more performant. So the next thing, um, obviously, then, is monitoring. Um, so monitoring um, for us means um, really a couple of key things. One is um, the log messages. So hopefully you're capturing the standard out, standard error of your container. Um, if not, the, the bit in built F stack for OpenShift works really nicely for us. Um, one of the things we have supplemented that with, though, is as well as the F stack itself, we actually change the way that the, the Fluent D um, instances on each of the worker nodes. So we actually configure it with the secure copy plugin, and we send another copy to a separate Fluent D forward that then sends onto our enterprise Splunk system. And the reason we do that is because, A, it's better for long-term log analytics. You know, we, we don't use the F stack for long-term security logging, long-term security analysis. It's really to help us with troubleshooting and, and short-term trend analysis. Um, but it allows us to then have something in Splunk to be able to go back to do long-term um, trend analysis security uh, off of. It's also really important because then you're, it's outside of like the platform administrator's hands. So from a platform support perspective, if someone compromises the platform, they can't, you know, they, they, they might be able to get into the Elasticsearch and, oops, sorry, we lost our Elasticsearch database and suddenly none of the log messages are there anymore. Doesn't matter, they're still going to Splunk. So we've got an extra layer of protection um, in, from that perspective as well. Uh, performance metrics. Performance metrics are obviously really important. So again, we use the, the inbuilt OpenShift Heapster Hortkula um, setup. And um, they are, they're really useful. I've actually, they've been really useful for developers just as a basic thing, to be honest with you. Forget about security for a second. Just to be able to baseline and understand the application as they start to do the development. And that's been really, really useful. Um, but the other thing uh, we've, we've done with the performance metrics is uh, we, we also use a product called Sysdig. Um, and we use Sysdig to monitor the entire cluster. So the metric stuff is really useful for a project administrator to be able to look at that particular project and say, uh, I understand what I'm doing in terms of CPU, network, memory, that sort of thing. Sysdig, from a cluster perspective, allows us to take a, 
um, a look at the entire cluster to understand all the namespaces that are running, to understand disk IOPS. There's a lot of really good stuff um, in there. I, if you haven't spoken to those guys, I really do recommend it. They, it's a really good product. Um, we also use their Sysdig Secure product as well, um, which I'll, I'll touch on briefly. Um, Sysdig Secure allows you to get a real-time data flow of all of the activity that's going on inside of your container, and I'll touch back on that um, in, in a minute as to how we kind of use that. Um, when we talk about monitoring, Prometheus tends to come up a lot as well. Um, I'd probably get hung for this. I'm not a huge fan of Prometheus. Um, it, it's a really nice tool. The problem with Prometheus is the, uh, in the current incarnation is the role-based access security or rather the entire lack of role-based access security. It's very, very difficult um, to be able to, to set it up. And um, we, one of the things we looked at very early was we could put Prometheus in, it would not be a problem. We'd be able to gather data, we could use Grafana, we could create lots of nice graphs and trending. But it was really only gonna be useful for the infrastructure team, for anyone that really had the right to be able to see the entire cluster. I've also got to be able to deliver benefit to developers. You know, the developers want to be able to know what's going on. One of the advantages we found with Sysdig is we can scope that data. So Sysdig has the ability to understand Prometheus export points, grab them, import them, and so you can effectively, we effect, can effectively use it to add scope and role-based access control to Prometheus data. Um, and it also now has a Grafana exporter, so you can even just use it as like a role-based Prometheus plugin between the two. Um, so that was actually one of the other reasons we didn't go the Prometheus route was um, because literally uh, Prometheus really is, is fantastic if you're a cluster administrator, but I also wanted to be able to provide useful data to the application developers um, and the application support admins, people who will need to see maybe three or four namespaces, you know, maybe a dozen, but they don't need to see the cluster. They don't need to see the Kubernetes events, but they do care about exactly how much, you know, what, what's, what's going on. They, they care about their application topology. They care about the eventing that's happening. So again, depending on your use case and your audience, that might be different for you. Um, but for us, that was absolutely a piece where we said, if we're going to add value um, and we're adding value to the actual end user community, which for us as developers, then Prometheus was not gonna get it done in the way we needed. So, networking. Um, for us with networking, just to be upfront, we use the, uh, the OVS multi-tenant um, plugin. So it's OpenV switch based, VXLAN based. Uh, every project has, has its own VNID. They're, they're segregated on the, on the network. Um, and the reason we did that was it gave us um, a, a level of VLAN-like segregation project by project, so we knew that project A could not start talking to pods in project B um, without explicit permissions, so it allowed us to, uh, to be able to, to segregate workloads um, efficiently. But one of the things we started getting into very quickly was, um, that's great, but actually if someone does compromise a pod, if someone does manage to get some kind of zero day exploit and get into your web server, what's to start, and say you've got a classic sort of three tier design just for the sake of argument where we have a, a web pod that talks to an application pod that talks to a database pod and they're all in the same project there's nothing in the normal VXLAN security you, there are things you can do with network policy now to be fair we, we didn't have network policy when we, we put all this in um, but there's nothing that at that point that would have stopped the web pod being able to reach around and talk to the database pod we did look at could we break these up into separate projects you start doing that you can do it um, but it does start getting clunky um, it, it, the, you, you will hit scalability problems. So what we started looking at was alternatives that would give us effectively a software firewall that ran inside of the cluster. Um, and so we've been working with New Vector um, pretty early days um, for, for both us and I think for them. Um, and they do a uh, layer four through seven firewall that actually runs on all the nodes and it runs agnostically of whether it's on bare metal on-prem or whether it's running in AWS. Um, and that's been really useful for us because it means that we can look at uh, both traffic flow, but we can also look at doing more granular enforcement where we need it inside of particular projects. So you can literally say, um, I need my front end pod to be able to talk to, you know, pod A to talk to pod B, pod B can talk to pod C, but that's it, and just on these particular ports. So traditional firewall sort of type logic. Um, but it also has the ability to do monitoring and, and sort of learning a bit like a WAF. Um, some of the other benefits we got from that 
which have proven to be, um, to be useful, is it can also, it also starts looking at the behavior of the applications talking to the, each other inside of the SDN. Um, the SDN itself can be a fairly opaque place unless you start getting quite advanced and plugging in and doing lots of tracing and things. Um, this, this allowed us to actually have something sitting there looking at the traffic in real time and identifying if it was seeing malformed packets. Um, you know, it's, it's almost moving to a, almost a, a lightweight inline WAF, so you know, looking for SQL injections and things as well is, is you know, not beyond the, the wit of possibility. Um, that actually has had a couple of benefits. One is, obviously there's the security element. We actually identified pretty early in the development environment, we, we, we noticed there were a couple of um, applications we continued to see, it said were generating malformed packets. It actually turned out it was bad code, but we were able to leap back, loop back with the development team and say, your pod over here is not behaving the way you think it is. Um, it, it seems to be creating what appears to be the beginning of a denial of service attack. Um, and it actually turned out that they got a resource leak and they were sending a TCP SYN and then the pod was collapsing. So it looked like it was a SYN flood attack. Um, but again, you know, stuff like that we were able to, um, to pick up with, with New Vector that otherwise would have been quite problematic to find. You know, so one of the things I would say is um, do take a serious look at what you've got uh, running inside the network where you can. Um, the next thing, applications. So. You know, one of the things we've, we've also been looking at is, is how do we start to stitch together the various pods? Because it's all right, again, understanding the performance of the cluster and the performance of the individual pods, but you've also got an application which is comprised of a number of those different pods and probably off-platform resources because much as I'd love it, not everything's running in OpenShift quite yet. Um, you know, so there's going to be databases that are off-platform, web services that you're calling. You know, there are going to be things like that. So one of the things we've been looking at is, you know, how do you start identifying those flows, understanding where the bottlenecks are, and that's where you do need to have some form of APM type tool. You know, there's still a need for that sort of thing. Um, that, that has been, for us, we've, we've got uh, a couple of different tools we sort of use in that space. Sysdig, I mentioned before, um, that allows us to do topology and traffic um, views. We've also been working with Dynatrace, um, and uh, that enables us to put together some behavioral um, maps of the actual applications, and those also are inc invaluable for business stakeholders. You know, because really, the rest of the stuff we're talking about tends to be the constituents are your, your infrastructure teams, your development teams, the application support teams. The APM view, that's the bit that really gets the product owners and the business excited because that's the piece where they can actually contextualize it. You know, a transaction for me is X cents. I can understand a drop transaction has a revenue impact. I can understand that, you know, these bottlenecks have a particular financial impact and we probably need to pay for more resource. It, it really helps with those sorts of conversations. So, you know, it's, it's something that for us, again, we, um, we, we've, we've been working on building that capability in. There are a few different, um, uh, different application performance monitoring tools that can run inside of, of sort of Kubernetes and OpenShift now. Um, your mileage may vary as to which one you pick. One of the things we, we tried to do um, was to try and avoid having the application developers having to make code changes to put their product under APM. So we've tended to, to look towards um, applications that run privileged pods um, as a daemon set. So we have a single daemon set APM that basically scans the worker node and does all of the APM. There are other, prod there are other ways of doing it. You can literally have uh, load a, a sidecar container in that holds your monitoring agent and run a monitoring agent inside the pod as a separate container image. Some of it depends on how you prefer to set your cluster up. You know, we, one of the things we did early doors was said, we want to try and look at how do we do this to be the most benefit and ease of use to the developers. So we don't want to say to the developers, congratulations, you've just gone through the new project wizard and OpenShift, you've just got everything configured. Now, would you mind just exporting your YAML and then adding this sidecar container to it and then deleting it and then running this OC command to re-import it and then by the way, you'll have APM because there's an error-related process in there. And granted, we could have put some stuff with, you know, Ansible Tower or, or something around it. But, you know, I think the, the, the metric we've used would be, what would you get if you go into a cloud provider? You would get this stuff that magically just works. You know, the, the complexity and the pain is taken by the service provider, and what you get as a service is just pops up and it works at the top. And that's what we're trying to build towards. And that does mean that there are times where you make your own life more difficult because it makes the developer's life easier. Um, so the other thing to think about is monitoring your kernel behavior. So this is again, this is more the Sysdig secure piece actually, so we've used Sysdig in this space. 
containers offer an ability to introspect the way your system is behaving in a way that you would never be able to do with virtual machines. So at the moment, I think oh, development environment, last time I checked, we were running over 3,000 containers. Um, and that was first thing on a Monday morning before anyone had started scaling stuff up. If I was trying to manage the behavior of 3,000 VMs, that would be 3,000 agents I've got to deploy and I've got to manage and I've got to upgrade. With Kubernetes, I've got 25 worker nodes. We run big nodes. Um, and that's 25 agents I've got to maintain and support. And, and it's a lot easier, and the daemon set uh, concept makes that really, really simple for me to do. I can roll a new agent out in 10 minutes. And if it doesn't work because it's containerized, I can roll it back. Um, and what that's all enabled us to do is with, with Sysdig is their secure product allows you to look at what is the behavior the containers are, are doing. What is it they're actually doing at a kernel level system call? So your security team can have a list of basically every command that's being run in every shell in every container. Um, so what, what's being executed as a, in a runtime. But you can also start to set behavioral policies. So you can say things like, if I'm in a production environment and I see something installed RP, to the RPM database, kill the pod because nothing should be installing an RPM inside of production. You know, if you're in a development environment, great, that's where you build your container, at least for us. No one builds in production. You know, your, your development image moves from development into production and you do not rebuild it there. So you know, if, if, if we see something trying to install an RPM or something trying to write to you know, uh, files under ETCD, sorry, under ETC, for example, um, we probably want to terminate that pod. And you can start to think about and set some, um, some policies um, with, with tools like this in a way that is, you just wouldn't, theoretically you could have done it with virtual machines, but the, the, the pain of trying to manage that many thousands of images just meant it was the, the problem of scale meant you would never ever countenance doing it because you, you just look at it and go, this is insane, I've, I've got too many other problems with my other agents. Um, and then the other thing for us is looking at cluster activity. So cluster activity, there are, Role-based access control is really, really useful. Um, it's, it's, it's very deep, it's very good, um, and it's something I'm really glad that OpenShift contributed back to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is sort of standardized on the, the role-based model. There are things, though, that where we found that uh, role-based access we'd prefer, it doesn't quite go far enough yet for us, so we're supplementing it with Tower. So an example for us would be on our externally facing production clusters, if I have a developer who is uh, pr just promoted an application, they just test, they want to test it out. I want them to be able to create a root, so a URL, for those that don't know OpenShift, it's a URL that basically applies to that a particular application endpoint. Um, I want them to be able to publish that URL, and as long as that URL is internal, that's okay, because that can only be accessed internally, they can, they can test the application, QA it, sign off on it, make sure it's good. I do not want them to be able to publish an externally facing URL because that is something that has brand reputational impact, that's got to go through uh, QA, it's got to go through pen testing, there's a whole other process we have to wrap around all of that, um, which comes back to, again, my point earlier about information security policies and best practice. So, at the moment, the role-based access control doesn't make it, well, really possible, to be honest, to, to differentiate between the, the two URL-based points and be able to say you're allowed to create one type of route but not another. So this is where what we've done is used um, Ansible Tower to wrap Ansible around um, some of those role-based um, access control type limits, and we've basically written playbooks that we've then published as REST APIs to the, uh, to the developers. So what we've said to them is, okay, we'll do that on your behalf, you just call this REST API. So if it's an internal URL, call this REST API, we'll create it for you, it's fine. Uh, if it's external, you can call this URL, and then we will basically, it will automatically go through the approval process and it will kick things off. Um, and I actually think the way we're going to do that is probably that's going to change and it will actually move underneath our ServiceNow um, and we'll go through a release manage, ServiceNow release management process and that will then call Ansible Tower. Um, but Tower's been really, really useful for us for that, to be able to, to take the team skill sets in Ansible um, and to be very, e very quickly be able to turn those into REST API endpoints, to be able to turn stuff around and, and enrich what we, we offer out to the developers and do it in a way that's fairly scalable, you know, because... For, for stuff that we literally will, will just do on their behalf, it, it's fantastic because you can literally just say, um, you know, call, this, U, call this, uh, this URL, call this REST endpoint, and we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it for you. So another example for that for us might be, uh, if I have two projects and I want to join them together in our development environment, um, they don't need to call an administrator to do it. As long as they own both projects, 
we've got some Ansible code that basically checks they own project A and they own project B and we'll then join them for them because that's the logical step we would go through as administrators. So we've codified a load of that. So some of the stuff with cluster activity, you know, think about from a security perspective, where's role-based access control taking it? Where are there limitations? Can you extend it? Um, again, it doesn't have to be Ansible. You know, for us, Ansible was a good fit because we're already working with it with the OpenShift installation. Um, but it's, it's worth thinking about um, you know, the, the activity basis, what do you want to do to sort of extend that? Um, and also, what do you want to do around limiting user permissions? And I think this, um, operators have sort of come to the fore since they got this deck done, but the operators thing, um, the operator framework is, is going to be an interesting conversation as we move forwards um, from a security perspective, and it's something actually I've been talking with Red Hat about, is um, if the operator framework is going to start requiring everybody to have a copy of the OC or the cube control command line on their desktop, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of that. I actually think it's better to have role-based APIs that the operate for, for so if I've got a database or I've got a, a message queue and I've got an operator that manages that queue, I think it's probably better to have a separate um, command line that, that calls that message queue rather than giving everybody the, the control binary. You know, that's, there, there are some vendors that go one way, some that go the other. For me personally, I think it's better to have that differentiation of tools because if you do ever get to the point where there is some kind of exploit or some kind of weakness in the, the OC or the cube control binary, then, and, and that's rolled out really, really widely, that's a big patching effort to deal with. Um, and also, you know, you, you're giving users tools then that they don't really need for, for necessarily for their role. So again, you know, that's some of what we're, we're starting to think about with operators is the sort of activities that will take place in the cluster and, and what's an appropriate way to manage that. Um, and so the final diagram is just really to put all that together. Um, so, you know, we've sort of think about your image provenance, your registry scanning, how your images are composited. Obviously, you know, you're going to need performance um, and uh, monitoring. Think about the kernel monitoring. There is, there is an ability to do stuff in there that is um, really, really good these days. Um, obviously, the, the CNI, the network space, think about what you do there. Um, again, depending on what your current network security looks like, what it is you, you want in that space, there are different tools, different ways of doing it. And the, the network space is, to be honest, very, very pluggable. What we've done is what fits our security needs. Um, but, you know, that's an area I would, I would recommend taking a real look at. Um, obviously, you know, the behavioral side of things, application performance monitoring, again, for those that have used it already, it continues to be a really, really useful tool. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the role-based access control, the sort of cluster activity side of things. Think about things you can do there to, um, to, to limit your user's access, but also if there are things, common things that they should be able to do, how can you, do, how can you extend it to grant them that access? Um, and that has pretty much brought us in with a few minutes left. I've got a few, uh, I used some open source icons, so I've properly attributed the, uh, the people they use them from. So I've got time for, uh, for questions for a few minutes, if anyone has any questions. Um, hopefully that was useful. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, do we have multiple clusters and what are the architectural boundaries and why did we do it? Yeah, um, so yes, we do. Uh, basically, the way we are configured is we have, at the moment, a single global development cluster, um, which all the developers globally utilize. Um, that's been an interesting one because we did think at one point we might need to start regionally segregating that, but some of the, we have a lot of globally distributed development teams and what we started to get was feedback from the developers saying, actually, we're willing to take a little bit of latency because we can all work together in a single environment. So for us, that's turned out to be a good fit. Beyond that, then, um, because of the nature of the data that we use, um, we have to get into regional clusters, basically. So um, we've got uh, clusters in North America, in Brazil, um, the UK, in EMEA. Thank you, Brexit. Um, <laughs> We've got um, Asia Pacific and Australia, again, because of some of the differences in, in, in the laws down there. Um, and we're getting ready for South Africa as well. So we're, we've got a plan over the next year to finish building a bunch of those out. And, and the reason we've got all those is basically down to um, the, the data protection legislation or, or sometimes client contracts around the requirements for data protection with the, the data sets that we hold. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how we're configured from a cluster perspective. Yes, sir. For Sysdig, uh, for Sysdig, we are currently using the SAS offering. Um, yeah, we, we went through a, um, 
I went through quite a lot of, of, of conversations back and forth with them, but uh, fundamentally, at the end of the day, we decided that, uh, quite honestly, it was just another Kubernetes cluster to manage and to patch and to maintain. And um, sorry, Red Hat folks in the room, here comes my rant again. If only OpenShift were a damn sight easier to patch and, and upgrade, then I wouldn't mind upgrading and managing another cluster, but it isn't. It's too painful. Um, so having one less cluster to patch and maintain was a good thing. Any other questions? Uh, so, right, so the way we do our clusters at the moment is um, we have, so it, when we're doing, if we're doing something that's AWS um, specific, we have uh, architected across three availability zones in a region. Um, so the control plane is separated across three and the workers are separated across three. Um, the intent being that, yeah, were we to lose a zone, we, we can work without that and we can reconstitute using Ansible the, the, the missing nodes in a, another availability zone. Um, for the on-prem clusters, the way we have those configured is we use, uh, we have two data centers and we're fortunate we've got private dark fiber connecting them and they're, they're fairly close, so the latency is very, very low. So for, uh, for those, we have the control plane runs across the two data centers and we have worker nodes in the data centers and also in three AWS um, availability zones. And the reason we've done that is because at some point those data centers over the next 10, 15 years will probably start to go away. So we can then start to decommission the data center and move the control plane out into AWS. Um, so we've sort of planned for the, the future from an architecture perspective as well. But everything, we, th those are stretch clusters at the moment. Um, ultimately, now, I mean, now the, the, the Kubernetes Federation has started moving again with the version two of the spec. So Hopefully, we'll get to a point where we can do more about having contained clusters with federation between them. Um, but we did look at the federation, but the, the problem, to be honest, was there, there wasn't enough agreement on what federation really meant to see that there was ever going to be ever meaningful progress made in the short term with that, so we kind of went stretch. No problem? Any other questions? Okay. Well, we've got, um, I think we're like three minutes before the end, so if I'll, I'll be hanging around here if anyone does have any more questions. Otherwise, just say thank you all very much for your time.